Um, well, I'm going to uh, try not to uh, make any formal remarks here for very long so that we can have a nice conversation. Uh, I, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background that probably isn't, uh, that isn't in the, my TED talk and, and um, is kind of fun to me, which is, you know, I, I was an undergraduate here and uh, that's kind of how things things got started for me. I, I had intended to go into politics, you know, I, um, I ran for the school board in Melrose, which is a suburb about eight miles from here, which is where I grew up. I was, I was living in Harvard, uh, and uh, right after my, the end of my freshman year, I <clears throat> decided I was going to run for the school board in Melrose while I was in school, and I did, and I won, and, and I served two terms. <clears throat> and my plan was I'm going to run for uh, school board, then state senator, then governor, then president of the United States. <laughs> that, was, that was the plan. I had an interesting thought yesterday, actually, which was 250 years ago, and for all time prior to that, there was no human being that dreamed of being president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> now it's like, right? It's like, it's like a common, common dream. And we act as if, well, it's always been. Um, but it was 1980. There were no openly gay politicians. I was beginning to realize that I was gay and decided that dream is gone. And, uh, you know, that's a very disorienting thing. To, to write off the thing. You know, you know people say you, you're, you're lucky if you find out what you're passionate about at a young age because so many people struggle with that throughout their lives and I felt like I know exactly what I'm passionate about. And then to have it ripped away was very, very disorienting. Um, and uh, I got involved with the Hunger Project, which was an outgrowth of Est. Um, and you know, started, started learning more about world hunger in a more compelling way from the Hunger Project than I was actually learning at Harvard, you know, like learning that 20 million people die every year of hunger and hunger-related disease and most of it's diarrhea and most of them are children and um, I just, like I'm sure all of you, couldn't recon reconcile what felt to me like the abject silence of the planet in response to this thing that as a working class kid I never was aware was going on. Yeah, I did the walk for hunger. My dad was a construction worker. My mom was a full-time mom. I didn't know about world hunger or the statistics of it. So what I started to learn about is why aren't people doing something big about this? And so here I I organized I was chairman of the chair of the Harvard Hunger Action Committee. I don't even know if it still exists. It probably doesn't. And we used to we used to do uh, fundraisers for Oxfam twice a year, and it was called the Fast for World Harvest, and we'd get students to agree to give up a meal, and the University Food Services would donate a couple bucks to Oxfam for every student who didn't eat once in the fall, once in the spring, and we'd raise <coughs> maybe four or five thousand dollars a year that way, and I was very frustrated by that. That just seemed like a non-starter. That seemed so puny and ineffectual, and I wanted to do something big. I didn't have any big ideas. And then the summer before my senior year, I heard about these two guys who were bicycling across America to raise money for cancer research, and that really lit me up, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take a group of Harvard students on a bike ride across America. So that next fall, my co-chair and I, his name's Mark Ticano, he's a congressman from Riverside now, we, um, we set up a table at each of the the time, 13 dining halls at Harvard for 13 nights, we spent you know, one night at each dining hall, and just ask everybody who walked by if they'd bike across America with us next summer. <laughs> and, and everybody said no. <laughs> <laughs> Except for 38 other people. Oh. Wow. So that next oh. summer, 39 of us took a six hour flight to cool. Seattle, and we spent the next nine and a half weeks pedaling 4,200 miles across the continental United States, and we raised about 80 grand for Oxfam, and we were on TV everywhere, we were on the Today Show, we got to run, ride around Shea Stadium before the Mets game, they played Chariots of Fire, and we up on the Jumbotron, and everyone was crying, and it was, uh, you know, it was an incredible experience to come back to Cambridge, you know, we finished at the Kennedy School, and uh, 
to feel spent and depleted like you had given everything you had. There was nothing left to give for something that you cared about deeply. It was a really powerful experience. And that's what 10 years later led to the creation of the AIDS rides. You know, seeing my friends dying and seeing the landscape of options, which were stick a red ribbon on your jacket, go to the AIDS dance at night, get drunk and do drugs for three hours on a Saturday night and so as some way of memorializing the friends that you died. It was pathetic to me, you know, so. So we created these long journeys, you know, the AIDS rides, and, and um, giving people a, uh, a greater opportunity to more fully express their, their grief and their passion and their activism um, in a way that was more organized and more sort of branded and consumer friendly than ACT UP was. You know, ACT UP was going to the pharmaceutical companies and, you know, throwing tomatoes at the windows and screaming at the top of your lungs. And, and, which was important and vital and, and played a huge role in everything. Uh, but not apparently accessible to everyone. How do I do that, you know? Uh, and then out of that came the Breast Cancer Three Days, and we built this wildly successful company. We had 400 employees. We raised almost $600 million in a short period of time. We went out of business as a result of criticism over overhead, as you know from the TED Talk. And, that led to the book that I wrote, and that led to the TED Talk, and the Charity Defense Council that I'm working on right now. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the whole story. And EST was a fundamental, fundamental piece of it. It was formative for me. We can talk more about that. But to get to some of the, we'll, we'll start with you, and then maybe we can, we can have a conversation from there. You know, what do we do as students to have the most value? <coughs> I get emails from lots of young people, and, and oftentimes they'll frame their, their desire as follows. I want to work in nonprofit. Can you give me some advice? And my response to that is, well, all right, nonprofit is a tax status. Why would you decide, why would you decide on the tax status under which you want to work? before you have decided what it is you're actually passionate about or what it is you're actually good at and where the intersection of those two things uh, are. You know, like, I am really glad that Steve Jobs didn't decide to go to work as a social worker because he thought that was the only way he could make a difference. Or, you know, you name it, Oprah Winfrey or Muhammad Ali or... Frank Lloyd Wright, I mean, what a tragedy it would have been if Frank Lloyd Wright decided to become the executive director of a soup kitchen because he wanted to make a difference in the world, and we missed the difference that he made by him following his passion. So, I think, somehow, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I haven't thought much about why it is, but smart young people come out of school with this twisted, narrow notion of how a difference gets made in the world. And that's expanding a little bit with this idea of social enterprise and social business, but that's still kind of non profit -y. It's still people thinking, I got to do something non profit -y in order to make a difference, you know? I mean, if you wanted to take an extreme example, and you look at the oil, you know, going to work for an oil company, right? The opposite of effective altruism and the opposite of having value, but oil companies are 80 96% owned by pension funds, mutual funds, individual retirement accounts. They're owned by your grandmother. So you make profit for an oil company and you're helping some old lady who's got a little bit of a pension set away. So it's much more complicated than we think. And there's a conversation about how the lines are blurring. Yeah, but they're blurred beyond the blurring that you see here. You know, They're fundamentally blurred in terms of you know, if we didn't have oil companies, we'd have a lot more need for charity, right? Uh, it's not to say we shouldn't move on to other forms of energy, but we, we have very short-sighted ideas about these things. So that's my first piece of advice is what, what, what lights you up? Like, what thing is going to get you to give your all to the world? And if that is not the nonprofit sector, do not go into that, that sector, you know? So what do you think about that? I, I think that's a good piece of advice that is often discounted in 
these like circles because there's such an emphasis on figure out what the best thing to do is like objectively in some sense and then like no matter what your skill set is like try to try to apply yourself in that direction right. and like that seems like another version of this sort of thing of like categorization and like trying to find you know the thing that's supposed to be good and I think like that's that's hard because like there are clearly lots of ways to add value to the world but it's hard to think outside of those categories like I, I think that like even coming out of college like very few people have a notion of what work can be in the world yeah. like the fact that like governments and companies and nonprofits are all just like groups of people doing something like a project but like that that sort of conception of like anything can be work and you can make money and add value and like do all of these things in lots of different formations and lots of different configurations I think is like yeah. completely not addressed and so people are still thinking about things in terms of like lawyer like consultant you know like nonprofit yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah. yeah. So, so just to uh, make it clear, uh, I'm not sure how much you know about the effect of altruism movement, but there is this organization called Eight Thousand Hours, uh, which is actually just on campus uh, doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching for students here, and they're a nonprofit that uh, also got into Y Combinator in Silicon Valley uh, recently, and uh, they what they do is um, first research and uh, then provide career advice to people who want to do. Uh, as much as possible, and uh, their framework is uh, very much, uh, very much em emphasizes that, uh, as as you said, uh, the ways of doing good can be very counterintuitive. So uh, uh, their typical example is that a lot of people want to go uh, and become uh, doctors without borders uh, and help people in Africa on the spot, uh, but they say, wait, it might be uh, much more impactful if. Uh, Instead of uh, going uh, going to Africa and making uh, 50k per year, uh, you became a um, well-off uh, doctor or better yet, uh, someone in, in finance in the U.S. and then funded say five doctors for doctors without borders because in all likelihood you wouldn't be much better uh, than than the other people that MSF would hire. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the point being that uh, um, maybe uh, that that the first. Uh, Piece of your advice, uh, like don't uh, don't think of doing good as necessarily going into nonprofit. It's like very much accented by uh, people in the effective altruism movement, and then there might actually be the other Opposite, extreme yeah, uh, yeah. that uh, uh, yeah. of um, not paying enough attention to uh, to your fit uh, as a person and uh, to your <coughs> personal skill set, uh, and it's just about figuring out like where do I make the most money or uh, where is my margin of like the highest? Right, and, and it's yeah, where's it's, the intersection between Ken Robinson's talk on how education kills creativity <laughs> and the effect that's an interesting question and the effect of altruism movement, right? <laughs> Have you guys seen that talk? It's yeah. the number one TED talk of all time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think that like the thing that the movement does quite well is you know challenging people to actually think critically about what they're doing. But on the other hand, yeah, it does sort of like kill creativity because I don't think it, it, it gives enough allowance for like, we don't know if this has empirical evidence behind it that this is going to be the best cause ever. Yeah. But, you know, we just like have a dearth of options now. Like people are, are, are donating as well, like better within the movement to the best charities that currently exist or the, the best enterprises that currently exist. But like, I'm wondering, if I want to grow up and not just like donate to the right causes, but like actually start one, it, does, it just doesn't seem like there's like a, an infrastructure to, to support that or like people who would support that idea even within this like very progressive movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next subject, mm -hmm. what else should we? Um, yeah, so um, you uh, talked a lot about uh, how, uh, how the makeup overhead basically uh, killed your enterprise and uh, how yeah. Uh, in Econ Talk, you mentioned how uh, badly the charities that you supported with with your core profits uh, enterprise did after after you left. Um, the question is: Do you have have you found anything that is effective in um, avoiding all the media uproar or um, or 
just like bypassing this uh, aversion of people to high yeah. overheads uh, and making charities work more efficiently? Yeah, we, we're working on an effort right now. Uh, it's called the Charity Defense Council, and I'll, I'll tell you what we're up to and what we're doing. Uh, but it's, it's worth a piece of advice just as citizens and people interested in civic engagement. I no longer believe anything I read in the news. I, I, I just don't, you know. Like, I, I am very grounded in the truth that I wasn't there. I don't know what actually happened. And there are people with a lot of different motivations telling me what happened. Um, so, just as a gay person, the other day, um, the, it gets reported that the Pope met privately with Kim Davis, right? Boom! Everybody believes it. And all over Facebook, I knew he was up to no good. I knew that it was, you know, it was just a facade, the Catholic Church, da 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 I'm agnostic with respect to the Pope, let me just say. But you could see, like, wow, smart people. The, you know, Pew does these studies every year that show 90% of people don't trust media, but on any given story, it's like 100% of people trust the media. So, you know, and so, so you just saw everybody ru rushing to judgment. The next day, the Vatican issues a statement. We didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't know who she was. She was part of a larger group. Here's a picture of the Pope with a gay couple actually embracing the gay couple. You know, What does everybody do? We were hoaxed. We were hoaxed. Well, that's a clever way of avoiding responsibility. No, you weren't hoaxed. That something occurred in the media, you believed it without questioning it, and you went and shot off your loud mouth as a result of it. Now you want to claim you're a victim of a hoax. You know, well, that's everything that's wrong. And if I could count the number of lies that were, were told about me, of the, I mean, just, just unbelievable things, you know. Uh, so. Whatever, from Benghazi to Enron, I just don't, I don't know what happened. And I don't really need to know what happened. Like, um, I, I, and you know, you see it with your kids. She hit me. She hit me first. Okay, I don't know where to go with that one, you know. Because you're both going to hold your positions on that. So, um, how do you change the way the public thinks about these things? Or bypass uh, um, public opinion. How do you bypass public uh, opinion? Either of those. Like, yeah. Uh, All right. Well, listen, uh, uh, bypassing uh, public opinion is a difficult thing because so the nonprofit sector in America it's a trillion dollar sector basically. It's about a third philanthropy. It's about a third government money and you know, government contracts, and it's about a third fee for services like when somebody buys a ticket to the opera or pays for a hospital visit. Of the philanthropy, of that $300 billion that goes to philanthropy, 75% comes from individuals. It doesn't come from corporations. It doesn't come from foundations. So um, the way the public thinks about these things has a lot of power. You know, it affects the way public policy makers make policy because they want to please the public. Board members for charities rise up from the general public so they come contaminated with these same dysfunctional ideas, even foundations or leaders are raised on these ideas. So changing the way the general public thinks about these things is really important. And, uh, and until we do, I don't think you're going to see nonprofit organizations taking the kinds of chances that they need to do, behaving in the way that they really need to behave, because they're more than a little cowardly about it, you know, because there are all kinds of job security issues and organizational security issues, and they feel like if I buck the system, I might, I might blow the whole organization up. Um, and talking about the media, the media responds to what they think the general public wants. So if they think the general public will believe that a, a highly paid CEO is a sensational story, well then that's the story they're, they're going to report. So for a number of reasons, I think, it's, I think it's really difficult to bypass the general public on this one. So we've aimed at changing the way that the public thinks about these things. On a micro level, it's easy, you know, I, I can give a talk, a 50 minute talk on uncharitable, 
you know, I do that about 50, 60 times a year. There are always lay people in the audience, and they'll come up to me afterwards and say, wow, you know, I'm never going to ask that question about overhead again. I never thought about this that way before. And if you look at it, people lead busy lives, right? Up here is their family, their job, their relationship, their health, and maybe way down there at the center of the earth is I want to spend some time thinking about the economics of the nonprofit sector, right? And probably not. So they don't think about it. So when you give them the luxury of some critical thought on it, they're quick to accept it if it makes sense and actually champion it on a micro level. Now, how do you do that on a nationwide level, short of having the entire country you watch the TED talk one night, right? Um, well, you need to get methodical about it. First of all, you need to stop being silent, okay? And the nonprofit sector is silent with respect to all of these issues. It doesn't have an anti-defamation force the way every other community does. So when it gets defamed in the media, there's no spokesperson there to offer the general public another point of view. When the CEO, say, of um, Boys and Girls Club gets called on the carpet for having a seven-figure, a six-figure salary, all of her peers head for the hills. They don't want to be associated with it. And so there's no one, CNN is just free to say whatever they want. And then the public believes it. There's no legal defense fund. So Andrew Cuomo is able to pass an executive order that limits executive compensation to charities in the state of New York to $179,000 if they get state funding. And they call that the Nonprofit Revitalization Act, of all things, talking about Orwellian. And we have no well-funded apparatus to sue the state of New York and to challenge that and to then let the general public know that we're suing the state of New York. We have no paid media strategy, okay? If you look at the milk industry, right, and the whole Got Milk campaign, the egg industry and the incredible edible egg, the oil industry with their question, do you own an oil company? Um, or the classic example, you guys are too young to remember, but back in the 80s, pork was back you know, thought of as this really fatty, unhealthy heart attack waiting to happen. And pork producers got together and they hired an ad agency. They came up with this slogan, pork, the other white meat, comparing it to chicken. And you now you eat pork, you think you're being a model of global health, right? If it's, if it's from Whole Foods, at least. Um, so, you, you see, you, okay, if we, if, we, if we change the way people think about pork and seatbelts and smoking, largely through public ad campaigns, we can change the way people think about charity. And then last, the sector is completely disorganized. 10 million people employed in the sector, no database of those people exists, none. Um, so you put those four things together, you've got a perfect storm of silence. So what we've started to do is, we've developed some creative messaging approaches to this. So we ran billboards in Massachusetts earlier this year, eight high profile digital billboards on like the Mass Turnpike, you know, I don't know, something like eight million impressions a month that simply said, don't ask if a charity has low overhead, ask if it has big impact, Charity Defense Council logo. It's the first time the public has ever heard that message. You know, they've always been told the opposite of that. Um, we're doing a campaign right now inside the sector that features people looking directly into the in the camera and the headline says, I'm overhead, right, because we dehumanize overhead, so we need to humanize it. So it says, you know, my name is Martin Hodges, I do fundraising for the breast cancer charity, I'm labeled as a negative, uh, as if I'm a, I'm a detriment to the cause, but without me there is no cause. My mother died of breast cancer, I, I multiply the money you put in and, and I'm overhead. And so we just went into New York and found all the overhead heroes in upstate New York and did a campaign <laughs> with all of them and those will run in their annual reports and their newsletters and things like that. We have another ad that asks the, the public a um, simple question, do you want to be the only donor? Because when you discourage your favorite charity from spending on fundraising, you're saying you don't want them to find other donors. Now, <laughs> Think about that. Do you really want them to keep coming back to you for everything, right? And that, will, whoa, okay, never thought of it that way. Well, my favorite is this picture of uh, a little kid dressed in a suit, six-year-old kid dressed in a suit with his piggy bank, and he says, I'm going to donate all the hard-earned money in my piggy bank to the local homeless shelter. And the subhead says, and I want them to spend 100% of it on fundraising and administration. <laughs> because I want them to grow. You know? 
So it is not for lack of provocative, plain spoken ways to communicate <laughs> to people about these things. It's just that the sector has been cowardly, has been oppressed, it's been afraid. So not only has it been silent, it's, it's, it's been worse than being silent. If you were to make an analogy to the gay and lesbian, lesbian civil rights movement, if silence is, I'm not going to tell you that I'm gay, right? What's worse than silence? Actively saying, I'm not gay, because there's something wrong with that, right? And that's what the nonprofits say, no, 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 no. Look at our seal of approval on our website. We have low overhead, right? So they're telling the public exactly the opposite of what the truth is, pushing the conversation backward. Well, a few people are trying to pull it forward. The whole sector is saying, no, 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 no. Let's get them back into their... their uh, hypnosis, you know. So, that's how I think we change the way, it, it, it's not that it can't be done, it's like well, we can't change the way people think about charity, really? We change the way they thought about women having the right to vote, slavery, pork, seat the way. Of course we can, we just need to make that a goal, and we don't have that as a goal. You know, if, if we keep doing what we're doing, we can't change it, absolutely. Um, so Est, how about we talk about Est a little bit? What's your interest? What, what do you want to know? Um, I, I know, like I, I had seen it sort of like peripherally mentioned in a book that I had read, um, and I know some people who have done uh, Landmark, which I think is like somewhat related, um, and the or sort of like human potential movement space is like somewhat similar. Right, right, right. So um, Est, I did Est. Est was this two weekend workshop. I did it. The first weekend at Harvard, my, my first freshman weekend at Harvard, I, I uh, so I, I graduated in 83, which was like, what, 75 years before any of you were born. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, <laughs> when I grew up in the, in the 70s, you know, I listened to the Cars in Boston and Springsteen and Led Zeppelin, but I also, in a very closeted way, listened to John Denver. I, I like, loved John Denver. And, Please tell me you all have heard of John Denver. Some of you don't know who John Denver is. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Anybody heard of John Denver? Nobody here has heard of John Denver. Wow. All right. So John Denver. Oh, you guys are going to get tweeted about it on Facebook about tonight. <laughs> all my, all my tears. Um, that's wild. Uh, so, so, so John Denver was... RCA Records, second biggest all-time record seller next to Elvis Presley. So he was huge. He was this huge, like, pop, country, kind of human consciousness music. And he sold, you know, millions of multi-platinum um, records. Oh, when, when Take Me Home Country Roads. <laughs> Take Me Home Country Roads, yeah, Rockin' yeah. Out High, any song. Like, Wind Song is okay. kind of my favorite album of his, if you want to ever buy a John Denver album. I think Wind Song is a beautiful album. And, um, so John Denver was on, uh, he would write these little things on his album dedicated to Warner Earhart and everyone in Nest. It's like, there's something about this guy. He talks about looking for space and I want to find out who I am. Um, and love is everywhere, I see it, you are all that you can be, go on and be it. There was a Zen quality to his lyrics that I'd never heard anything like it before. And I was like, what is that? It's a different dimension that he's, that he's writing in. So I, I, I wrote to him, I said, I want, what is this S thing? He sent me a brochure, I was too young, he had to be 18 to do it. So as soon as I turned 18, I called up and I registered for it. And it was like this two weekend experience of enlightenment, like Zen enlightenment. And it was very, very powerful for me, and and it was also about possibility and how you know the stories you tell yourself in your head and how they the self-limiting identity that you have, how that voice that's going on in your head all the time trips you up constantly, and dissociating yourself from that. And then S started this thing called the Hunger Project, and John Denver was on President Carter's commission to end world hunger. So a funny thing happened. So I was chairing the Harvard Interaction Committee. I really wanted John Denver to come to Harvard and speak about it. Uh, so I was a freshman. I was living in Wigglesworth Hall. And I wrote, I typed up a letter on my typewriter, because that's what we had. 
uh, and white out in case you made a mistake, you know, white it out and go back and retype over it. And I wrote this letter. I went out, it was raining, I put it in the mailbox in front of Wigglesworth Hall and I ran back in. The phone was ringing. I pick up the phone, it's the Dean of Students, Archie Epps, and he says, are you Mr. Pallotta? Yes, I am. We just got a call from John Denver's office. He wants to come to Harvard to speak. It was like really, really like synchronistic Carl Jung collective unconscious kind of thing. And uh, so he came and I hosted him and I got to meet him and he gave a talk at the Science Center about the Hunger Project and everything. And it was it was it was really great. When I get asked, it was it was about like human understanding, like putting yourself in the other person's shoes. It was about love, you know, like having real love for your your fellow man and woman. Taking responsibility for your judgments. Taking responsibility for your cynicism. Taking responsibility for your communication and the way you communicate with others. And I knew at the age of at the age of 18, this is it right here. This is getting at the fundamental root of all of our problems, because all of our problems stem from an inability to understand one another, to understand what the other is going through. And to this day, I believe that. You know, we can change the way people think about charity, and then they'll make a difference, but it won't make the ultimate difference. We could still existentially, you know, we could, we could still blow ourselves up, and there's a high likelihood that we will. It's a very, very small sliver of time that we've had these weapons, right? So to me, it's like, uh, yeah, and that's where the important work of the world is to be done. How I've not focused on it is actually something I'm looking at right now. Like, the older I get, the more I feel like that's, that's the kind of work I really want to do. I think that's where the greatest difference is to be made. Because um, we, you know, we think, we think Afghanistan and Iraq and ISIS are the enemy, and, they, and what, 6,000 Americans kill one another every single year. You know, all kinds of domestic violence. Human beings just cannot seem to get along with one another. It doesn't matter whether they cross the ocean or not. That until we grapple with that, until we expand that consciousness, all of the other stuff we're doing is sort of for naught. You know? Puritans. Puritans. <laughs> <laughs> Puritans. Um, so. Before we move on to that, yeah. can I just ask a clarifying question about the last point that you made? Yeah. So it's totally following you up until the last like 30 seconds, and that was a little bit confused about the direction. So is it existential risk, or are you talking about the actual thing you like to focus on? It's trying to get people to sort of pay attention to Personal the transformation. Behavior. Yeah, okay. yeah. Personal so. transformation is, is, I really think, where it's at. Um, you know, like if Congress did the S training, if Congress did the MR. <laughs> I mean, you'd see a transformation in the country, you know. Like, they would go in and they would do this, asked, and they would do it in prisons. Um, and transform the prison population and the way people were relating to one another. Because people had these fixed positions about, you did this to me, I will never forget it, that is the story of my life. And they carry the story around, you know, like this massive weight for their whole lives, not realizing, yeah, that's it's just what happened. And you can let go of it. You know, it's just what happened. It's going to get worse if you continue to carry it around. S used to have this saying that would drive people crazy, life is empty and meaningless, right? And what they meant by that was, your mother yelled at you when you were three years old. You created all of this meaning out of it. It wasn't there. You concocted this story. You created all of this. So when they said life is empty and meaningless, it was like, things happen. You, you create all these stories about what they mean. They don't actually mean that, you know? And then you carry these stories with you through your whole life, and they, they inform everything that you do, and what you think about yourself, what you think about others. Uh, yeah. So tell me what you'd want to know, what, maybe for the, yeah, the sure. of everybody. Would. So uh, I think a lot of the stuff that you pointed out in TED Talk is, is true, and I think it's also pervasive. And I'm wondering where these sort of funny intuitions come from that are often, you know, counterproductive. 
that uh, sent charity back uh, and handicap it and sort of make it impotent relative to what it could be. And you made a sort of pretty strong claim in the second half of the talk that this is a holdover from sort of Puritan idealism. Yeah. Uh, some very, very confused self-loathing and, you know, <laughs> right, right, and right. I'm just sort of wondering if um, there might be other explanations for some of this stuff. Yeah. And yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Um, you know, I wonder about it myself sometimes, and it, it's a it's a bit, it's a bit of a shtick for me, you know. But but it's not to say I I don't have passionate belief in the fundamentals of it. But um, and if you haven't read my book on charitable, there's a, there's a, a section on this whole Puritan thing. It's like 19, 20 pages long. Just got it on Amazon. Oh, great, great, great. Uh, yeah, so I wrote this book and I said, you know, we have this screwed up way of thinking about charity. We don't want charities to spend money on people, on advertising, we don't want them to take risks. We don't let them think long term and there's no capital markets, there's no profit. And my agent challenged me. She said, how do you, uh, oh, and I had grown up in New England. I was this Italian kid in this Puritan culture, right? And, and there was a big difference between my Italian relatives and the noise and the plenty and the bounty and the emotion and my the Puritan neighbors. And and so I, I I I grew up in New England. I wrote in the book a sentence. These ideas come from old Puritan constructs. It was very Puritan, you know. So my agent challenged me. Said, "How do you actually know that?" So I spent the next six months reading these narcolepsy-inducing books on the early Puritan settlers to New England. And and the long and short of it, you know, you read John Winthrop, who was the first governor of Massachusetts, who wrote the famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, where he denigrates profit. Meanwhile, you look at his journals, and he and his partner are calculating all the profit they're going to make in the new world. So you could see that um, they come here to make a, a, a lot of money. They come here for religious reasons, absolutely. They also come here because they see a lot of money and animal husbandry and agriculture and all kinds of other things. Um, and they're accused by the other colonists of being very uh, aggressive capitalists and price gouging. Like the Puritans were accused of price gouging, excessive price gouging. At the same time, they're going to church, right? At the, at the same time, they're Calvinists and John Calvin, the French uh, theologian, taught literally that human beings were um, hereditarily evil, that they were evil in the eyes of God, that even um, children before they're born have the seed of evil in them. So the, the Puritans were taught literally to hate themselves. Um, so this creates a problem, right? They're taught self-interest is a horrible thing. Self-interest will send, get you sent directly to hell. But at the same time, they're taught that self-interest excuse me, doing well is a sign that you are right with God. Having the largest state is a sign that you are right with God. But self-interest will get you sent to hell. So it's okay to collect bounty and build a big estate so long as it's not for yourself. And one historian I read said, you know, you had to be a mental contortionist to reconcile this. And there was no psychotherapy back then, right? So they're just struggling with all of this stuff. So charity becomes their penance for, for making money. So, of course, you, you couldn't make money in charity. It's your penance for making money. And financial incentive got exiled from this realm of helping others so that it could thrive in making money for yourself. Uh, and by, by the way, it was mostly women in the Puritan churches. There's actually, I found a statistic that 70% of church attendants were, were women, which mirrors perfectly with 70% of the nonprofit workforce is, is female. Um, and there's kind of a metaphor for gender discrimination going on where the, the for profit sector is male, metaphorically, the nonprofit sector is female. So the for profit, the, Male is where all the real serious work of the world gets done, and here you you dabble in idealism. And we'll give you a little bit of money, but not too much, and we gotta, you know, put you on a short leash. Um, and I, you know, when I when I've thought about it, well, you know, what about Canada? What about Europe, where there are these similar ideas? I think anywhere where the concept of original sin was pervasive, where the self had to be negated because it was evil. 
charity became this convenient place for negating the self, and as it became this compartmentalized place. Because if you look at, like, like in Bangladesh, um, Grameen Bank, it was started as a for-profit endeavor, you know, you, you didn't have those heavy, guilty uh, overtones, so um, happy to be challenged on it, or, or hear other ideas you have about it. Yeah, so uh, I should start off by saying I certainly have no answers, uh, yeah. but, but I think that it's entirely possible that uh, there are some sort of deeper psychological intuitions that drive this stuff. So, like, um, one theory that I think has some intuitive pull that I've had on and some empirical support is that we don't like to mix categories um, across our boundaries, like family and uh, sort of reciprocity in business. That seems to be a, a human universal. People always are kind of scritched out by mixing uh, sort of what they see as altruistic acts you know, within uh, a family unit or within like a reciprocity relationship with business and profit motives. Yeah. And uh, I think it's pretty hard to explain that type of result with uh, like a Puritan or cultural based theory. The people don't get as sanctimonious about that one as they do about this one, right? They don't get as morally outraged about combining mixing family and business as they do mixing charity and profit? I mean, I think, you know, if, if there was an audience for it, like if people wanted to read those tweets, I think they would, they would rage just as hard. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, there's sort of a, a focal point where everyone can go, oh, that guy who's pretending to really care about some cause is really just in it for the money, mm -hmm. right? And I think that provides uh, an opportunity for lots of other people to bandwagon and just say, like, yeah, screw that guy, you know? Yeah. But there's no, you know, outside of this sort of family unit, there's no audience for this information, right? Yeah. So I think if there were, it's entirely possible we'd see the type of moral average we see that you're giving away. Yeah, uh, interesting. Yeah, so, so the, the, that's the type of idea, but I think that... Uh, you did a really, really nice job of highlighting particular places where the system is failing. And it sounds like this organization that you're working on now is, you know, in part designed to protect people's reputations and to sort of get the word out and advertise. But also, you know, I'd be curious to see, like, do you have a plan for knocking down these particular screw-ups? You know, are you going to do what you did with this billboard for all of these uh, sort of issues one by one? You know, is that the, is oh, that the I, I see. Um, I don't know if we'll handle it in quite that way. When you when you sort of topple the overhead thing, your your the overhead measure acts as a governor actually on all of those different things. You know, mm -hmm. you spend too much money on a CEO, your overhead goes up. You take a risk and it doesn't work out. You got to book all that expense with no revenue, your overhead goes up. You mm -hmm. take too long to achieve a result in the short term, your overhead goes up. So you. You, you, you start to create a lot of enlightenment when you move people off of the overhead issue. Mm -hmm. So you're just hoping it's sort of snowball. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. You know, we're kind of s starting with this, but, but I think it's a combination of things. So you go out in the media with a don't ask about overhead issue, then you sue the state of New York, and you, and you, you, you use your PR engine to publicize that, and you explain to people that you're handicapping the nonprofit sector by limiting compensation here. Then you go on CNN and you talk about some other issues. So you're, you know, the ad campaigns are only one facet of the work that's being done to change mindsets. And those other things might not necessarily focus on overhead, you know, the anti-defamation work, the legal defense work you might not have an overhead focus. Mm -hmm. Can I ask what your thoughts are on um, the whole emergence of like big corporations, social enterprises that have like you know function like the private sector, but that either donate all of their profits to um, some other cause or have a social permission embedded within them. I think the wonderful developments, B Corps are wonderful developments. I don't they don't address the issues that I'm talking about. Um, so. You know, the nonprofit sector exists really to correct for market failures. And, you know, as I said at, at, at TED that, you know, I think business will lift the great mass of humanity up. It may, it may do it very unequally, but, it, it, but if, if people get an air conditioner and a refrigerator, they're still being moved, moved up. 
but I think business will always leave behind 10% because you need a monetizable market in order for business to work and there are some issues where you just you, you can't make create money measures so so philanthropy is critical for that and so and as long and and, and philanthropy fuels the nonprofit sector and the nonprofit sector is the beneficiary of philanthropy they're tied at the hip so until you liberate the nonprofit sector from these anachronistic restraints you, you aren't going to address that 10 percent and and B Corps aren't really aimed at that 10 percent they're aimed at the other 90 percent of economic activity and making it more compassionate and more responsible which is wonderful but they're not pointed at you know the dysfunctions that continue to exist in Oxfam's ability to operate and to scale you know I mean, Oxfam is a 65, Oxfam America, I think it's a $65 million annual budget. They started around the same time as Apple, you know. Yeah, I have a question. So, you were very young when you uh, organized the uh, markets for AIDS, and it was a tremendous project that you created value of. 300 something million on that uh, for, for we raised uh, I think 582 million dollars total yeah yeah uh, and I'm sure like most of us can't imagine pulling something like that up do you know like what some of the prerequisites for uh, for going in, into a project of that scale uh, in such young age are is it, uh, are, is it just the drive or do you need some specific skills or did you like learn anything during that process that uh, most people don't get about going into something of such a scale? Yeah, first of all, you know, don't be intimidated by the scale of it. If something like that happens, it starts at a very small scale, you know, and I think that's the way every successful business happens. Um, we did the first AIDS ride and, and it was a success. It netted a million dollars. We thought it would raise six hundred thousand dollars. You know, that's something that any one of you could could imagine. You know, putting together. You do that, and then you say, "All right, I want to I want to take it to the East Coast." Now it's work to do that, and it's work to raise the capital to do that. But you take it to the East Coast, and it works. That becomes a little easier to take it to Chicago. A little easier to take it to Texas. A little easier to take it to Florida. Next thing you know, you're doing five AIDS rides and you get 78 employees. Then you say, well, why does this have to be limited to AIDS? Let's do it for breast cancer. And you find a partner. And the next thing you know, you know, you've got this, this large business. Um, so don't be intimidated by the, the end scale of it. Things start out small. I think, you know, um, You can't, the, the big ideas in business, in philanthropy, in your life, in my experience, you know, others might have a different experience, but in my experience, they don't come on demand. You know, you can't sit down and bang your head and say, I want the next big idea to come. I'm desperate for it. I want my Mark Zuckerberg idea. Um, or maybe it wasn't even his idea. <laughs> Or you can't have an off-site meeting and say, you know, this company is terrible, we need the next big idea now. Victor Hugo had this famous quote, uh, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Mm -hmm. So you kind of want to be on the lookout for what are the ideas whose times are coming? Like, and then have the courage to say yes to them. I think that's the way you want to look at it. Have the courage not to say no to them. Like, you don't want to be the guy at Decca Records who said no to the Beatles and <laughs> along, right? And you couldn't have contrived to the Beatles mm -hmm. on, the, on the flip side of that in some off-site meeting or tragic as it was, you can see clearly that the AIDS rise would not have been possible in the absence of AIDS, right? Mm -hmm. So AIDS comes along, I didn't know it was going to come along when I was a freshman in college, I didn't know, oh, I want to organize large bike rides for and journeys for critical issues. Mm -hmm. AIDS comes along and you find yourself wanting to respond to it and you do. 
and then your company goes out of business and it's a great injustice and you say, I've got to do something about this. I could not have seen that five years beforehand. So there's this dance that happens between your intention and your preparedness and what comes at you from the world. You know, you're going to get phone calls that you never expected, you're going to get emails that you never expected, offers that you never expected, some of them are going to be un incredible, some of them are going to be the most tragic, heartbreaking things that uh, you, you never wanted to happen to you. And, you know, the story of your life unfolds at the intersection of, of those things, of, you know, your intention and your, and your preparation and, uh, and the, the circumstances of your time and of, of your life. Uh, there's a saying in AA, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> <laughs> tell her your plans. <laughs> Um, I think you may have been pointing at a, at a different thing. You know, a, a part of the being able to build the AIDS rides or, or anything that you want to do is having capital to do it with. I heard someone say last week, you, you need to have enough capital to fail and not be out of the game. Um, in every case, I had just enough capital to fail and be out of the game if, if it didn't go right. But you know, we had to get very innovative because there weren't capital markets for things like the AIDS ride. There weren't venture capital funds to take this idea to. So, uh, the very first AIDS ride, we got the LA Gay and Lesbian Center in, in, to put up 50 grand because we thought that would be the negative cash flow on the AIDS ride. It turned out to be 170 grand, but we got a sponsor. Just before that 50,000 ran out, we found a sponsor that gave us. $120,000 and then we would go around the country and I would meet with different charity boards and ask them each to put in a little capital with the sponsorship money and that's how we capitalized the AIDS rides. It was an arduous, long sales cycle you know, I was flying all over creation. I was in my 30s, I didn't have any other responsibilities, I didn't have a family, I didn't have kids, I could do it, I loved it. And then when it came to the breast cancer three days we went to Avon and we said we don't need your sponsorship money, we just need your capital to start these in new cities. And they did that. Mm -hmm. And then we had grown large enough where we could go to our bank and say, you loan us the money to do new things and we'll give you the deposit business. And that's how we generated all of the capital for that. It's interesting, you know, you guys are at a, at a wonderful, wonderful time in your lives where you can take a lot of chances um, and they don't affect anybody really other than you and, and now is the time to do that. You know, now I, I'm married, I, I, have, I have three children and I can't, I can't be so reckless, you know, <laughs> because it means their whole future and, and, and uh, you, you know, I have a little bit less appetite for risk. When we launched the Alaska AIDS vaccine ride, the bank said, yeah, we'll give you a million three. You guys sign a personal guarantee for your house, your savings, the clothes on your back, everything you own. I said, where do I sign? You know, <laughs> here, let's go do it. Now, today, yeah, no, 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 no way. One other thing to take from this meeting, don't ever sign a personal guarantee. <laughs> remember, remember, remember when you're trying to finance your idea, there was that guy that spoke to us at that dinner, I don't remember much of what he said, but he said don't ever sign a personal guarantee. Francis, there's Lance, do you have a question? Um, I think, I was wondering in terms of collaborating with other groups on campus that you had experience in. Um, recruiting sort of people who may have like slightly different goals, but uh, you know, like fundamentally very similar. Whether that was like a good strategy to make something large happen. You know, it it, it was an uphill battle, and I I feel for you guys because, um, you know. This is not like sexy work that everybody runs to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's quite something to say. We went to we went to the thirteen dining halls at Harvard, and we asked six thousand people if they'd bike across America, and thirty eight said yes. You know, um, but there's that great Margaret Mead, right? Never doubt the ability of a small group of dedicated citizens to change the world. It's the only thing that ever has, and it's true. We didn't. Uh, 
we didn't collaborate with other groups. I don't know, you know, who we would have. Phillips Brooks House, maybe uh, Catholic Student Center. I, I was actually some of the kids. Geez, I think four or five of the riders were from the Catholic Student Center. Do, do they still have the? Any of you go to St. Paul's Church? It's still there. Do they still have the? Do they still have the folk mass with guitars and stuff? There were a group of us on Sunday nights. It was packed. I mean, there were like <laughs> nine hundred kids would go to that mass, and like there were eleven of us. We'd play guitar. You know, we'd have a folk that we called the folk mass, and uh, and a bunch of those kids rode with us. But there was nothing more formal uh, than that. What I'm curious, what what drew you all to this effective altruism idea? Was it that it was the only game in town that had uh, an organization? Was it something about the philosophy in particular? Tell me what drew you to it. So for me, it was uh, partly the philosophy. I, I was interested in the philosophy at high school, read Peter Singer, um, and I would, like, always wanted my beliefs to be consistent, and this just seemed like the only consistent uh, moral framework out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, so like, part of it is uh, this, desire for consistency and the second thing is also it's just very exciting to be able to um, like there are such awesome opportunities uh, if, if you look at the very best things that you can do uh, for for the world um, there's just so much so this uh, philosopher at Oxford Toby or calculated that if he just gave from his uh, from his uh, income as an academic uh, to uh, uh, Charity that treats trachoma in the developing world. Um, um, he would by, by the end of his life, he would be able to uh, treat eighty thousand people of blindness. Wow, wow. Uh, so, that, and this like basically the, the lower bound on what you can do uh, because like with an academic salary, uh, that this is attainable. Um, so it's just also incredibly exciting. What uh, and I like never um, felt the drive to maximize my. Own, uh, own salary beyond some point of comfortable living and it just seems obvious to me that uh, I should try to improve the world with, with the rest of my time and effort and like, doing it in the best way possible seems like a good way to spend that time. You know, you made me think about something which is, I'm not sure that like, the name is the best thing to lead with, right? <laughs> it's this abstraction. Yeah. Whereas when you say, and I do say this to nonprofits all the time, but, you know, they speak in abstractions. <coughs> when you say, you know, a person with a very modest salary over the course of their lifetime can, um, you know, prevent blindness in 80,000 children, oh, okay, now I'm interested, you know. And I would just say in your own communication, let effective altruism live way in the background. Don't even utter it, you know. <laughs> um, Instead, tell stories, you know, mm -hmm. that that would excite people. And I think that's where hopefully the VR of, of the movement is, is moving, and that's why uh, it's, it's growing pretty fast currently and attracting more and more people, but there's a lot to be done. Do you ever see that thing on YouTube with this, the, the, the blind guy, and one he, he's got a sign that says, blind, please help. And a woman takes the sign and she scribbles something on the back, and he's not getting any money. She flips it around and it says, "There's a beautiful sunrise and I can't see it," and and people start giving him money. You know, it's like the way you talk about these things is very, very important. Yeah, I, it's kind of funny because the movement was effectively started, or like a large portion of the people who started the movement come from this particular community of like wanting to be very rational and being very comfortable thinking about them in, about that in very like abstract like uh, sort of intellectual terms rather than really connecting to that in a sort of um, emotional sort of lay person way so like there's this community that formed around this blog and forum that um, largely produced a lot of the effective altruism movement and like the hilarious thing is this this forum is called less wrong and it's like the worst <laughs> branding you could ever have like ever. And, <laughs> and, my great. and some people will really resonate with that and like you know will think it's great and like some people will be like what the hell is that <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah so there's uh, like if, if we want to 
spread that message to a larger audience. There's definitely a long way to go from the very nerdy side of, of the spectrum to uh, more normal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And there are so many groups on campus that are organized around public service or around. Um, they are not or are. They are organized around. Uh -huh. They um, you know do speakers or fundraise speaker talks or uh, fundraisers about global health, international development projects that directly work with companies that do that. Um, so we're not the only group group that's sort of in that space, but. Have you all met? Is it in like a, a big like weekend retreat type thing or something? Not really. There's yeah. uh, there's like some collaboration between the global health initiatives, mm -hmm. um, but also in this way this could be. Um, that would be a cool thing to do, you know, because you're all pointing at the same thing, and the, and the strength in those numbers might be very encouraging to all of you, and new ideas might come out of it. Who knows? You could form this Uber big thing, you know, that's like, uh, that subsumes all of the different ideas, or you just cooperate with one another, but I always think, uh, I always find bringing people together face to face, and uh, you know, like we, we have a creative agency, and, and, and the most creative work comes when we're just grueling it out in person, batting bad ideas around, good ideas, you know, I, I think if you guys had to all a Saturday together with a strategic agenda and, and some mm -hmm. desired impact at the end. I think it'd be very powerful. Because it's got to feel a little lonely sometimes, you know, even though there are seven or eight of you here. I know it did when, when we were in school. It feels like, all right, there's 6,000 people out there and eight of us in here and they could give a shit about what we're talking about in here, right? you know. And, excuse my language. Um, so I, I would encourage you to do something. I'd be happy to come and give a little talk or something if it was if it made sense as part of the agenda. <coughs> well, I'm happy to stay a little longer. It's getting awfully warm in here. Oh, yeah. You guys probably have work to do, so you know, I, I thank you very much. It's been a good conversation. I'm happy to stay in touch. Would like to stay in touch. You know, you, you know my email address is easydanadampalata.com. If you've got an individual question or something you want to shoot me. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome.